Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Bob? Bob Glassman? <laughs> I'm Bob Glassman. I live near Don too. He's recruiting everybody, so we're all going to be in it. Um, that's right. I, um, I've spent the last 42 years running my business as a hardware store in Philadelphia. I was the first uh, Ace Hardware in Philadelphia in 1973. Uh, before that, I was an electrician for 10 years. Uh, I did mostly uh, new construction work. I uh, did actually schools. Um, we've been so busy with our new home and with the business over these last 42 years, I haven't done very much ho hobbies, done a lot of traveling, um, and that's my life. Welcome aboard. Welcome. <laughs> Additional guests. Uh, my name is Bob Kalick. I live uh, not so far away in Woodcrest here in Cherry Hill. I'm a real estate investor, and uh, this is Dick invited me. This is my first time here today. Great. Um, I, uh, hobbies, I, I used to travel a lot, and then we had two kids. Uh, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, so I don't get to do that much anymore. So uh, sometimes you'll see me out on my bicycle. That's about it these days. Great. Any other Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Marty Heiligman. I live uh, up the road, Wilderness Run. Uh, retired attorney. Had my own practice in Philadelphia for about 30 years. I've been retired for a while. Uh, I, as far as hobbies, uh, I'm here most mornings at the, at the gym, play a little golf, uh, have four grandchildren nearby, watch them occasionally, and uh, that's about it. Well, welcome. Anybody else I miss? Oh, right in front. Hi, I'm Craig Wynn. I am David Wynn's son. And Yay! <laughs> All right, calm down. Calm down, everyone. <laughs> Uh, he, he dragged me to, uh, to uh, South Jersey in the early 70s. We've been here ever since. Um, I so went to school and everything here. I currently work at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a general internist, a dying breed. Um, and uh, I look forward to the time to actually have hobbies. Um, but I do do things like uh, bike. I'm trying to compete with Mike right now on the espresso. Uh, I look for his name and try and go one ahead of him each time on the, on the competition. You do pretty well, um, but well, but thanks for welcoming me here. Anybody else? Okay, it's our tradition that our new members, our guests, if, I'm going to ask you to stand and lead us in Hamotzi. Okay, ready? Here we go. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Hamotzi Lechem Minamor. Enjoy breakfast. Everybody go eat. First, I would like to acknowledge we received a, a thank you card from, from Gary. On, you know, we did Minion, and again, our condolences to you. And, and Bill did a great job in leading things, so our condolences again. Also, we lost a member, um, Ralph Bernheim, and uh, our condolences to Gerson and Howard. So we hate to give that type of news, but. You know, one of our strongest points is we try to be there for each other. And, you know, in the case where it has to be a minion, uh, you know, we always rally and, and we're always in support of our, our membership. So, okay, I'm going to ask Dave to come up and I'll be calling him back in a little bit, but to talk about the sukkah. That is uh, our habit that started about uh, two years ago, is we've been asked again to uh, build the community sukkah. And uh, I will be passing around a list. If uh, you can uh, complete it, I will uh, send it to the people who are getting that information. I, there was an email I went out. You can send it in by email. But we have the list here, and I can give it. 
Hopefully this year we won't have uh, something like Bob uh, Greenberg uh, deciding to walk on air and falling, uh, you know, it's a little fall. Uh, we do have some people here that uh, like to do construction work and so forth. Hopefully we'll get them to sign up. We had about a dozen people last year. It was a lot of fun. And at the end they give you pizza and so forth. Uh, you work with uh, a lot of the staff here, but they do need uh, other help. Me, I can only do minimal manual labor. We need somebody that knows a little bit more because pieces fit together and they have all kind of uh, um, diagrams and all that. So people that are a little bit more intelligent and that kind of stuff than me need to be there. Anyway, I have this sign up list. I'm gonna give it to this table here. Once it's gone, please, as uh, last person, give it the next table and let's move it all the way around. And at the end, I'll take it and hopefully we'll have this page full of names that I can give to the JCC. Thank, Thank you, Don. Now, we do have a, a lot of youthful people that participate in this that aren't a member of our group. Uh, so it's not like we have to do the heavy lifting. Like Dave said, we had about a dozen guys there last year. 11 of, of us were there to lift Bob off the ground after he did a beautiful somersault. <laughs> <laughs> it was the fall. <laughs> it was the fall. That's for sure. But uh, if you could help, <clears throat> it's really a fun activity. We have a lot of people that help. They do provide the pizza. So it's a good deal. <clears throat> and uh, Ed, can you give us a uh, finance report? <laughs> Ed is our treasurer for those that are new. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to, in case. <laughs> right now, I just I was getting that light like right in my eye. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Dave. Um, I just wanted to um, add to what Don said about um, Ralph Bernheim. I don't know if how many people really know Ralph and his his uh, son and his uh, son-in-law. Uh, they joined us about a year ago. Ralph was the, I think he's a World War II veteran. He, he, was, he was 92, I believe. Um, his son is um, uh, Gerson, uh, Bern, uh, Gerson, oh boy, senior moment. Um, any, go ahead, Marty's going to look it up for me. Um, Gerson and his, um, his son is Howard Bernheim. Right. And um, Gerson, Gerson and his father-in-law live up in Cinnaminson. Um, and uh, Ralph, I think, lives in Yard in the Yardley area. They had a minion. We didn't know about this till I happened to play uh, poker with uh, with Gerson. And uh, when we went to organize this week's poker meeting, he said, "I'm not going to be able to make it. My father-in-law died." So we we missed the minion. We did, had no idea that they had a minion. I think it was Monday and Tuesday. Um, what was what was Gerson's last name? I see a Ralph. No, Ralph Bernheim and, and Howard, Howard. Uh, Gerson. Well, it'll, it'll come to me anyway. Um, so just to give you an idea of who he was, he was a World War II veteran. Um, seemed to be sharp as a tack when he was here. He was yeah. here at a number of our meetings, um, but anyway, we lost him um, over the weekend last weekend. We did send a call. Yes, yeah, the we club, the the club the uh, acknowledged it, and if anybody else wants to send a card, uh, talk to Len Berman or send him an email. Um, regarding dues, I guess you're all aware now that uh, we we're starting to collect dues for the new year, which started September 1st for us. Um, if you didn't pay them and you still want to pay them this morning, come over to me and uh, pay me. Um, and whoever hasn't paid, if you would pay at the next meeting. Yes, sir. That doesn't entitle you to does not entitle you to a free breakfast. We've, uh, we've changed that since the uh, previous year. Um, so it's 42 for dues and seven for breakfast. Um, and that'll, that'll uh, cover the year from... You get a t-shirt. And you do get a t-shirt if, if, if you're a new member. If you're an old member, you should have a t-shirt. If you haven't gotten one, uh, talk to Don. I think we found the, uh, we found the missing t-shirts. We have them over there. Um, other than that, uh, really, no no major change in the finances. Um, I don't think I have anything else to anything report. Law enforcement breakfast and re reconciliation. Uh, law enforcement breakfast. I think I, I might have mentioned it the last time, but in any case, um, the uh, the club netted about 
um, somewhere around $700 uh, before the donations that we're making to uh, Hero Scholarship and the uh, Goodwin Holocaust Museum. And uh, we're still waiting for uh, one of our sponsors to uh, make the final payment, and then we should be cleaned up on the law enforcement breakfast. But uh, it was successful uh, from a financial point of view, and it's uh, uh, about it, I think, Don. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a lot of new people. I'm going to ask Mike, 30 seconds, what's the law enforcement breakfast? Mike chairs it. And I really think that we got to be aware that we have a lot of new people that uh, aren't aware of what we're talking about. For about, um, first of all, good morning, everyone. I guess now it's about 20 years now that the South Jersey Men's Club has been uh, doing the law enforcement appreciation program. And we worked through the police chief associations of Camden, Burlington, Gloucester, and Salem counties, and the prosecutor's office. And we honor the local, uh, state, and federal law enforcement officials who, uh, who are good guys. And we have them nominate people for receiving a special award. And we have a very nice uh, breakfast once a year. Sometimes we'll skip a year if the law enforcement officials tell me that it's, they're watering down the standards too much, wait for somebody else. And we've had some amazing, amazing individuals that have been awarded the uh, South Jersey Men's Club Jewish Community Award to law enforcement. And I urge you to come. Uh, the next time we do it, we moved it to Tuesdays. We found that doing it during the week gave us a tremendous, tremendous boost in attendance from law enforcement officials. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Dick on uh, membership. Dick Knopf is our vice president of membership. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, there's plenty of food up there. Seconds, come on, go get them. <laughs> Salmon, what else we got? Uh, cookies, uh, Bob, what else? Muffins? Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> what does he know? Same, <laughs> same, di same difference, same difference. Great turnout today, not, and not only that, how many new potential members do we have, Don? Uh, five, 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 12, what? Quite a few. Quite a few, thanks for coming. Uh, the great thing about this organization are the guys in it. That's, that's what makes this group. Sure, we provide service, we do law enforcement, a lot of great things, a lot of great activities that you can get involved in. But I think it's the camaraderie. And every now and then, somebody plays around with their iPhone like Jerry. But most people usually <laughs> listen to, to, to me or ignore me, either one. Um, what's the deal on t-shirts? Uh, was I supposed to say something on that? Yeah, Why don't you say it? All right. Well, the t-shirts, again, that's part of your dues uh, when you pay now. So if you don't have one, make sure you see Dick. We are short of mediums and small, so we're going to be ordering more shirts, but please make sure, <laughs> too many bagels, what can I tell you? <laughs> but please make sure you see Dick to make sure we get the right size order, but we're going to have to order probably a couple yeah. dozen more because they've been going pretty quick. And what we do, we ask you to wear them to our breakfast meetings and all functions that we attend, unless it's a right. dress-up one. Uh, it gives us an identity. Uh, when we go like to the Sukkah building, you know, hopefully we'll have 12 guys there all wearing shirts. People recognize us, and they realize the contribution that we're, we're making. Other than just going somewhere as an individual, we'd rather have the recognition for the South Jersey Men's Club. Jerry? Jerry? You have a no, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. And uh, the new members, you, you need an interest survey? You know? Uh, yes, I didn't bring them with me, though, this time. Okay. But I will definitely at the next meeting. I knew I forgot something. I think I was carrying so much I couldn't fit it all into my trunk. Uh, anybody need an application? Let me know. Or if you know of someone that wants to join or is just thinking about it, drag them here, and uh, the, the odds are pretty good they'll want to be part of us. And I guess that's it. Terrific. Thanks. And Dick does have a, an interest survey for the new members. That way we have some idea of some of the things that you would like to do. 
and we can try to incorporate that in our programming. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Dave again to talk about JAG and what JAG is. Okay. Uh, <coughs> JAG is an organization of the um, various men's clubs throughout the area. Uh, and for those couple of synagogues, Sons of Israel, Nur Tamid, uh, that don't have a men's club, the entire synagogue uh, can belong. And it's an organization that is set up to try and get competitive uh, uh, situations uh, between the clubs. The obvious big, big thing that's there is uh, softball. Uh, and we have a very good softball team. We went all the way to the finals, lost in the finals. But we usually do, are very competitive. But there's also a lot of other sports. Now, it's interesting that I came up right after the discussion about the interest survey, because we, the next item to be held is the bowling tournament. In the interest survey that we conducted, 10 people indicated interest in bowling. Now, in a bowling tournament, the top three scores count. I certainly hope out of 10 people that indicate interest, uh, Bill Roth is one of them, for example, uh, uh, Mike Perloff is another one, Hopefully, uh, we will get enough people, meaning three or hopefully many more, to show up for the bowling tournament. Uh, you already got the email from Randy going across the board. Um, I'm going to be sending something out to all the individuals that uh, indicated interest, and I'm going to ask you to contact Barry uh, Rosenberg, who is our vice president for athletics, but he also is interested in bowling and would like to have a good bowling team. And if a couple of new p uh, people here, when you fill out, fill out the survey, if you're interested in bowling, let me know and I'll add you to the contact for this particular event. But uh, this is, is going to be our event. It's going to be right after the holidays, two weeks from the day. Uh, the following month in November, we're going to have the tennis tournament, which is doubles. And the month after that will be the pinochle tournament. We try and have some, uh, some non-softball event going on in the uh, spring and in the fall. Uh, so hopefully you all participate, you fill out the survey, and if you fill out the survey and say you're interested, hopefully when we announce those things, you'll participate. Thank you. And additional notice will be going out via Randy announcing right. <coughs> each of these. I just want to ask about the thing that went out for the sukkah. Has it gone to every table yet? No, but all, all the tables over here got it. Then hopefully it'll go to these two tables over here afterwards. But Randy handles our communication, and he will send out anything that we ask him to forward so that you have the additional information and you can you know, print it right out. Also regarding uh, sports, we are in our third week of fantasy football that we started last year. Let me just say, is there, if you're an owner of a current team, just stand up. Including me. The millionaires and billionaires. We're having a, a, a wonderful, wonderful time. Guys, you could sit down. Now, if you are currently in first place or tied for first place, would you stand up? <laughs> oh! <laughs> they are 2-0. and oh. We are having a lot of fun. We've added people. I think it's going to be growing next year. Uh, if you have an interest, you can even let me know now, and I could hook you up to at least follow a team. I did that for, for Dick Knopf, and he's hopefully following uh, the team that my son and I have. You don't want to know the last place players? Oh, <laughs> I was, Mike, I wasn't trying to single you out, but it's only a temporary situation anyhow. Uh, also, as a little aside to that, we had our draft at La Terraza on Route 70 in Cherry Hill. And we were very impressed by them and the setup they did for us. And we might be looking to have, and they seem very amiable to having us back for other functions. So we might have a real good, a nice private room, could seat 45 for uh, Hamish Hoedown possibly. So that might work real good for us. Okay, Ed, uh, JCRC, Jewish Community Relations Council report. Thank you. I'm a little intimidated. I'm representing the men's club at the JCRC uh, board, and our guest speaker is also very active at the JCRC. So if I don't get it right, Bob, step in and help me. <laughs> okay. Um,
just a couple of activities that you might be interested in. And um, tomorrow, there's going to be a um, celebration of a military hero from the Israel de uh, Defense. Uh, he'll be uh, coming to the JCRC tomorrow at 7 o'clock. We're asked to come out and participate. There's going to be refreshments. And he's going to be speaking. So we'd like to see a turnout. If you do come, wear your shirts. That'll be tomorrow at 7 o'clock at the uh, JCRC, at the uh, temp, uh, JCC. <clears throat> oh, and um, Sunday, October 5th, the Holocaust uh, Museum is doing a program. I don't know if you're aware of it. The uh, JCC bought a building on Springdale uh, from the Bethel Church. And there's going to be a march from the church to the JCC. Uh, it'll start at 9 o'clock in the morning, march to this building. And there's going to be a keynote speaker, and I'm told she's marvelous. I hope we can have a turnout. She's the daughter of a righteous Gentile whose mother ser saved Jewish uh, people from the Holocaust. And I'm told she does a marvelous job of speaking. Do you want to say something on that? I've seen her uh, last year. She came for an event, and she's amazing. She's a very, very riveting speaker. So yeah, I thank you. Um, I, I put a... Uh, flyer on your table. There's extra flyers actually downstairs in the lobby. Uh, there's a charge of $35, $36. Families are $54. Unfortunately, it happens to coincide with another event that Dave Swartz is going to talk about from the Family Service Association, so Jewish Family Service. So hopefully between the two events, we're going to really support the Jewish community. Lastly, there is an organization within the JCRC. It's called the uh, Jewish Catholic Muslim Dialogue. I still want to call it the Trilogy or Trialogue. Um, their main function is to see if we can improve the relationships between the three communities. And because of the conflict in the Mideast, they put out a position paper. And it was published in The Voice. And I have it at your table as well. Uh, Len Berman, who's also a member of our group and is on the board, I think he represents one of the temples, I'm not quite sure. Uh, he and I both join, uh, signed up to join this committee. So I might be reporting and asking you for feedback relative to the activities of that group. Oddly enough, when this position paper was written, I'm told that two of the Muslims walked out of the, uh, organ of the meeting. I don't see anything in here that would offend any group, but. You can read it and make your own decision. OK, thank you. Bob. I want to just talk a little bit about the Mideast Institute that's going to be coming up earlier this year. I'm going to let you talk about it, but I forgot. I was asked to remind, Don asked me to say one other thing. Unrelated to the JCRC, I'm supposed to remind you that we have a book exchange back there. So bring books, take books. We have a music exchange back there. Bring music, take music. We're also collecting eyeglasses, cell phones, and um, personal care products. Uh, by the way, we sent a lot of personal care products last month to the Operation Yellow Ribbon Club. If you remember, we had a speaker. Uh, he sent us an email thanking us. It was a ton of stuff. I think Dick Knopf uh, got it from one of the hotels. Uh, probably weighed about 80 pounds. <laughs> uh, so they were very grateful. All of that gets sent overseas. So if you want to say something about Mideast, I, I invite you to say it. Mideast Institute comes in uh, February this year. Uh, the final plans have not as yet been set. When they are, we'll let you guys know because we're a main sponsor of the Mideast Institute. Um, there's the potential that they may have it at night. Just give you a little heads up. And for those who don't know what the Mideast Institute is, it's an educational forum to discuss the current issues of the day having to do with the Mideast, uh, usually involving Israel always and other things. Uh, last year they talked about Iran and the possible nuclear capabilities. Um, I'm not quite sure what they want to talk about this year. Like I said, it's still in the planning stage. Thank you, Bob. Marty, anything on Israel, a trip to Israel update? Unfortunately, the answer is no. I mean, uh, I had a conversation, or at least I had an email that I sent uh, uh, to Mark, who had made a 10-minute presentation uh, last time, and 
she hadn't gotten back. And so I think what we're going to do is we're going to drop her. And I'm going to be looking at the Gill Agency in Philadelphia, who creates many, many tours that go to Israel. And so hopefully I'll have some information for the next meeting. Thanks, Marty. Mike, Mike's going to give us a brief uh, introduction of what we're going to be doing as far as we're celebrating our 25th anniversary, believe it or not, and also has some comments regarding Israel. Thanks. Uh, how many people here were, were from Beth Jacob, Beth Israel? So as you can see, quite a few people may not even know about Beth Jacob, Beth Israel. Back in 1986, Don Weisenstein was president of the men's club for Beth Jacob, Beth Israel Synagogue and ended up uh, getting a charter from the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs to be Club 531. Uh, 503. Sorry, 503 from, uh, from that group, which is men's clubs in the conservative movement for all of North America, and there's a few e even in South America. And it turns out that we have actually won more international awards than any other group in the world. We haven't submitted one in a few years because you can't duplicate them. You know, so we're, we've been out of that for a little bit, but we're going to probably do some more for the next convention. Um, we plan on celebrating our 25th anniversary. Now, 25th anniversary of what? The 25th anniversary of after the men's club folded and after the synagogue folded, the guys got together every once in a while and decided, why did we have to stop? So 25 years ago, we reconstituted the men's club and changed its name to the South Jersey Men's Club, maintained the same charter, and here we are today. And the interesting thing is, it's, how many people never heard of Beth Jacob, Beth Israel? Okay, and that's part of our heritage. So we'll be, um, we'll be having a 25th anniversary celebration sometime this year. And this year is uh, started in September. We'll started this month, September. And it turns out that we've had quite an impact over the decades. Everything from the Jewish athletic group that we started to the law enforcement breakfast that we started. Building the sukkahs, uh, you may not be aware because you weren't a member then, Dave, but we actually were building the sukkah when, when the JCC was on Route 70. And you'll learn more about that at our celebration. Bob? We also moved the Holocaust uh, Museum from Gratz to here. We have a sheet of paper. Actually, it's about four sheets of close type lines that describe everything the men's club has done that, that we can remember. And I'm sure we left a few things off. And we'll have that posted someday for, for people to look at. The board members have all received that. Do you want me to say something about uh, an Israel update, too? Quick thing on the Israel update. Thank goodness there's uh, no one being killed lately. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, the Islamic resistance movement, which, as you've learned before, is the real name of Hamas. Uh, have, uh, they're, they're in a deep argument with the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is the organization created after the Oslo Accords to administer the territories that Israel was going to give to the, eventually for a state for the Arabs of Palestine. And what is the argument that they're having? Well, one side is an Islamist group, and the other side is a kleptomaniac group. And the kleptomaniac group, the Palestinian Authority, is publicly accusing the theocracy, Hamas, of stealing the money, the, the aid money. Good grief, go figure. They ended up getting billions of dollars to rebuild Gaza, and they put it into tunnels and munitions, and very little to do everything else. And I think that's, uh, that's about the update, excepting this week, uh, Avigor Lieberman, the Israeli uh, foreign minister has been in, in Washington. Makes it very difficult uh, for people like myself who deals with the staff there because they're all running around in circles trying to please him. And one of the headlines is that he thanked the government of the United States for the help and support that they offered Israel and followed through on for the most part during the last incursion into Gaza to stop the, uh, to stop the attacks on the civilians of Israel. And that's the update. Any questions? Thank you. 
One, one thing I, I want to mention too, when we were granted the charter to continue after BJBI, you know, it, they really had the expectation that we would fall away by the wayside within a year. Well, we're 25 years later and here we are and we're still doing a lot of wonderful things for the community. Dave, would you like to come up and talk about uh, JFCS and you could lead right in with the speaker. Good morning. The main um, function that we have scheduled is October 5th um, where they have what they call the sort. Food comes in from various synagogues, all synagogues. That's collected over the High Holy Days. It's taken to Makor Shalom and starting, I believe, this time is 10.30. Uh, they sort the food um, by canned goods. First of all, it's all non-perishable, canned goods, box goods, what have you. It's sorted and then moved over to their warehouse for distribution. The one thing you need to remember when donating is uh, they prefer kosher food, um, but nothing is thrown away. Everything is sorted by those guidelines and uh, distribute it accordingly. So put that on your calendar, October 5th, uh, 1030. Thank you. I'm a court. Anyway, he has quite a um, resume, so I'll be absolutely brief. Most recently, Bob is the major gifts chair of the Jewish National Fund, serves on the Jewish National Fund Budget and Finance Committee. And in the spring at the Mideast Conference, he received the Israel Advis, Advis, I can never say it, Advis, Advis. Advis. Award. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. He has a period, he's a periodonist, has a practice in Cherry Hill, has degrees from Rutgers and the University of Pennsylvania, and has taught at uh, the University of Pennsylvania for over 25 years. So with that, I welcome uh, Bob Benetton. And Pam, thank you for coming, too. I don't need a microphone, do I? But I will turn off the lights momentarily, and, and then you can all take your nap after breakfast. So um, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about um, why I'm a Zionist and how proud I am to be a Zionist, and how we should never apologize for the state of Israel. It is our land, and I'm going to give you a little historical perspective and talk about some current issues uh, that are in the news in the last uh, couple of weeks and even slightly before that. So if we could just kill the front lights, do they, do they work half and half? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to start with the premise that the Jews have a right to a Jewish homeland and have had a presence there in that land since biblical times. The modern state of Israel is not in, a, in Uganda, which was one of the potential plans when Theodor Herzl went uh, on his treks. It is in Israel where all of our biblical history is. And what I will say is, and I don't, don't, don't look at this chart because it's a lot of whatever. All I want you to see here, well, I hit two, two twice two. What, all I want you to see on this slide is that this is the number of Jews in the world, and I want you to, and blue is, is Israel. So I want you to see that in most of history, we've had a presence in that area that's called Israel. That's all that chart's there for. Uh, it's a really neat timeline, though, if you want to look at it later, uh, you know, whatever. Abraham's journey in 2,000 years before the Common Era, Abraham set out from Ur, Ur, Ur and walked along and ended up down in Egypt and then came back in, in this area. But the next slide is the one that really is our biblical history. And this clicker is clicking. Um, this is the route he took through Judea and Samaria. You'll hear me use the term Judea and Samaria as opposed to the West Bank. Everybody, everybody know what the West Bank is? It's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Okay, as opposed to the East Bank. So the term is just a geographical term. Judea and Samaria are the original um, uh, territorial names, and that's how I'll refer to this area. So this is the path that a Abraham took down through as he went down to, to Egypt. Uh, Beersheba's here, Jerusalem's here, and, this is, and the whole history is along this road. Beth Beitel, Shiloh, Shechem, et cetera, et cetera. So this is biblical proof if you feel that the Bible is indeed a viable document, which all of us here do. Um, and these are, as a, what I'll show you is a little bit of history timeline. 12 tribes of Israel around 1200 to 1000 BCE. Um, I'm having trouble with the clicker here. Come on, there we go. Um, 
Let's see, it's going too fast for me. Okay. Uh, 967, the Israelite kingdom under Solomon. Uh, at this point, the temple was built. Uh, the first temple was built. 775, this, the area continued until, I'm going to actually put on my glasses just because I like to get dates correct, until the temple, which stood for about 400 years, uh, was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BCE. The Jews were in Babylon for 70 years, at which time they came back to Israel and began to rebuild the temple. So you know most of our prayers, if I, if I forget Theo Jerusalem, may my right hand lose its gunning. All these things happened in relation to talking about the uh, exile in, in the first temple period. So 587, the Jews leave Israel. Uh, 70 years later, they're back, and the second temple period goes from 516, so we have a 600-year period, again, back in our homeland, up until 70 in the common era when the Romans destroyed Israel um, uh, and, and Jerusalem. So this is a, a, a painting by David Roberts that I just found last night on the internet. I thought it was really kind of neat, so I just put that in. Um, different groups, colonial groups, had this whole area. The main one was the Ottomans, which is what led up to our modern history. Uh, this is 1916 to 1921, the British Mandate period, and this really is the beginning uh, of, of the modern state of Israel formation, and I'm, I will digress in a moment. The British Mandate talked about Palestine, and they divided it into two separate areas, Palestine and Transjordan. The Jordanians, the, the Arabs would have Transjordan, and the Jews would have Israel. That was the mandate, that was the plan, and what happened is the Jews purchased land. I'm going to do my JNF digression in one moment, but if you see all these towns, Metula, Zichron Yaakov, Hadera, Tel Aviv, Petach Tikva, Rishon Lezion, Rechavot, that land was already Jewish land when the British Mandate period occurred. So it's not like, like we were newcomers even in the modern period of time. The, um, the Aliyot to Israel, they talk about the first wave was I think in the 1890s or 1880s after the first set of pogroms and they carried through all the way through until after World War II and not to mention all of our modern history today. Um, Slight digression, as I said, I'll mention um, this man. Everybody know who this is? Dreyfus, thank you. In 1890, uh, 1894, Theodore, uh, Theodore um, Alfred Dreyfus was wrongfully accused of treason, and um, the young reporter ca covering the uh, trial was Theodore Herzl. And Theodore Herzl said that the only solution for, for anti-Semitism anti was a Jewish state. And so he set out after this trial um, to <coughs> form the um, Zionist Congress. And in 1897, he held the first Zionist Congress. At the fifth Zionist Congress, um, as he says, in Basel, I laid the foundation for a Jewish state. And at the Fifth Zionist Congress, which they all rented tuxedos and dressed up for this wonderful photo, um, at the Fifth Zionist Congress, a fund was called for. And on the fourth day of the Fifth Zionist Congress, Herzl pleaded uh, for the establishment. After striving for so many years, I'm, I'm challenged today. After striving for so many years we, to set up a fund, we do not want to disperse again without doing anything. That motion passed, and the National, Jewish National Fund, Karen Kiyemet Israel, was founded. And it was founded to purchase land in the modern state of Israel because the land was governed by Turkish law at the time from the Ottoman Empire. So in 1903, JNF made its first purchase of 50 acres in Hedera, and I showed you all those settlements by the 20s when the British Mandate occurred. This was all JNF land. Um, so the, the purchase of land, uh, these little blue boxes are all over the world. I always show this photo here because when we were in, on vacation uh, a number of years ago in Dubrovnik, this was actually in their museum. So these blue boxes were all over Europe. This is Croatia. Come on, there we go. By 1948, there were 650,000 Jews. <laughs> it's got a mind of its own. There were 650,000 Jews in Israel living in 305 towns. 233 of those were on towns built on Jewish National Fund land. So we actually owned almost two-thirds 
uh, or more of the land that became the modern state of Israel. So we often say the United Nations didn't really give us anything, they just sort of codified our existence. We already owned the land, we bought it according to Turkish law. Um, Today, there are 700,000 uh, acres owned by JNF, which is about 14% of the land of Israel. 80% of the land is owned by the government, uh, and about 6% is owned by private holders like the, the, the church um, and the Rothschilds and a few other people who have some land in Israel. But that's really my digression about land in Israel. So Jewish National Fund was founded to purchase land in Israel. What we do today is way beyond that. That's another whole discussion. So the United Nations Partition Plan, November 27, 1947, um, was to divide Israel up into a land for two peoples, the, this land for two peoples, a, um, a Jewish land, the lighter green, a Arab land, and an international Jerusalem. And it was based purely on population. And what they did is they looked where the populations were, and actually there's a lot of interesting stories about Jerusalem that it actually should have been Jewish, but at the, they kept changing the boundaries of Jerusalem in order to make it almost 50-50 to be able to justify a, an Arab land there. Bob, I think it's important to point out that that General Assembly resolution was right. really nothing more than a recommendation to change... Absolutely. The Absolutely. And actually... Had this been accepted by the Jews and the Arabs, there would have been, this plan would have been in place. Uh, however, the Jews accepted it, and we all know the rest of the history, the Arabs did not. Um, so, it, so this is the UN partition plan again. <laughs> uh, and just a little better map of, of what it was supposed to look like. And the State of Israel is declared by Ben-Gurion on May 14th, 1948, and on May 15th, the British withdraw and war breaks out. I could talk for hours about the Six Day War. I mean, the War of Independence. Well, I'll just talk about the Six Day War. The War of Independence, Israel was attacked by every country surrounding it. Okay, you all know the story. The war went on for almost uh, a year. Uh, there were different times when um, different things were um, signed. But the War of Independence, as I said, a topic of its own and the green line. So what does the green line mean? I, I, you probably know, but I'll tell you anyway. There were two generals after the, um, or after the um, war over Jerusalem, Moshe Dayan and Abdullah El Tal, who was the Jordanian com commander. They met in uh, the Masrara neighborhood in a small home, and they took a map. And <laughs> Dayan had a green wax pencil, and Abdullah had a red wax pencil and they each drew lines as to what they were holding at the end of the period the active period of war over Jerusalem and that the green line sort of stuck there was an area in between that was called no man's land I'll show you a picture of that in a second and at the time this was not, nothing more than a temporary ceasefire line so when people talk about the 1967 borders the green line this is really the 1949 armistice line it's not the 67 borders it's a historical line that was meant to be negotiated for final boundaries that never happened because the Arab, the Arab nations never agreed to negotiate and find those final borders and have a peaceful coexistence. So the green line is the 49 armistice line. Don't let anybody tell you that there's a 67 border. It just sat in that position until the Six Day War, at which time Israel reunified Jerusalem. So here's a picture of Moshe Dayan and Abdullah El Tal uh, on, November uh, on November 30th, 48. And this is what it looked like. So here we have the red line, which went around the old city. And then we have the green line. And interestingly enough, you'll notice Mount Scopus. There's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about the area between Mount Scopus and Jerusalem and convoys. Uh, doctors that were ambushed there. There's many, many stories uh, in the period leading up to the Six-Day War. But what you see here, unfortunately, is that the old city was in Jordanian hands. There were a bunch of areas that were no man's land. Um, there's stories about kids that their soccer ball would go into no man's land and they'd have to call the United Nations together uh, and they'd have to have representatives from both sides to go and recover. The, the kids' soccer balls or the nuns' teeth that fell out the window of the convent. You're smiling, you must have heard that story. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stories about no man's land. Basically, it was the land that was in between the old city and the boundary that Jerusalem uh, attained after the fighting in the uh, War of Independence. 
And it really was no man's land. It was barren, nothing, areas right in between. Today, this is all built up. So, and these were the armistice lines. Um, and again, um, Ralph Bunchy got a Nobel Peace Prize about putting the agreements in place that were going to ultimately be negotiated and never were. So that's some of the history. So these are the armistice lines in 49, and they held through 67. In 1967, um, well, I should stop or go along the way. There, there was the Sinai campaign, in, at which point Israel went all the way to the Suez Canal and uh, all these areas, which they gave back uh, for um, a negotiated ceasefire. Uh, and then the Six-Day War, which you all know the outcome of. Uh, and at this point, Israel was at its height, uh, obviously from a standpoint of world opinion, et cetera. Um, I often say we missed some interesting opportunities back in 1967 that we may never have another chance for in Israel, but uh, that gets very political. So I'll leave that for another, another debate. Um, but this is what things looked like after 67. Uh, the Yom Kippur War, when they were attacked from the north, from Syria, and again from Egypt. And the Yom Kippur War, taken by surprise, I'm actually just reading the book, The Prime Ministers, that talks a lot about this. Golda Meir was advised that nothing was happening. They were just doing some practice drills, uh, and they were, to they were totally surprised. And uh, Israel lost a lot of boys in that war because uh, fighting back to get back territory is a lot more expensive in, in human life than it is to try and you know, maintain what you have or go forward. So this was a very devastating war for Israel. Um, but thank God they were able to, with many, many heroic stories, uh, maintain uh, Israel. So peace with Egypt in 79. Again, Israel gave land for peace. I don't know where that ever came from, but Israel's been uh, very, uh, forthcoming with, with giving back things that they wanted more. I always thought that the spoils of war were yours. That's the most history until somebody else beats you. Israel's giving back land for peace many times, uh, and some of the results have not been as good as they want. Uh, obviously, Egypt, we have a peace for uh, 35 years. It's been a cold peace, but a peace nonetheless, and the current government of Egypt is very much in favor of keeping it the way it is. Jordan is also a peace treaty in the 90s, although I don't have that as part of this, um, as part of this presentation. But the Jordanian peace treaty, Jordan really depends on us. A much of their security is through our intelligence in Israel. So um, they're actually one of the borders now with uh, ISIL, or I I I I IS, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're, they're actually going to be depending a great deal on Israel intelligence going forward. So I'm not too worried about the Jordanian peace right now. The king still needs us uh, more than we need him. So I return to my original premise that the Jews have a right to a Jewish homeland and have had a presence in the land that compromises uh, the modern state of Israel. If you go back, you can say Balfour Declaration initially, San Remo Conference, all of these and the United Nations all gave credibility to a Jewish homeland, a modern Jewish homeland of Israel, in addition to the biblical history. So make no apologies for being a Zionist and saying that this is our land and a Jewish homeland. The discussion that you, that you can have today is if in Judea and Samaria, and I'll talk a lot about now about the current situation, in Judea and Samaria, if the goal is to have a peaceful coexistence with the Arabs, and in order to do that, they need a homeland, which personally I think that they do. I do believe in a two-state solution. The question is, what does that look like? And I, I, I leave it to the scholars to figure that out, because I know I can't. You'll see in a minute why. Um, but what I'm going to say is, if we give land for peace, we're giving land that's ours. Biblically ours, we want it in wars, et cetera, et cetera. The Balfour Declaration, all these things, this is Jewish land. If we give it to the Arabs, we're giving it. We're not giving it back, we're giving it. Okay, uh, that's, that's the premise I'm gonna go by. We have every right to this land. So modern Israel, uh, what I'm gonna show you, uh, just we'll talk about Israel, size of New Jersey, in a very difficult neighborhood, Lebanon to the north, Syria to the northeast, Jordan and Egypt, you know the, the map. Um, this is what it looks like, tiny little Israel in the middle of 27 Arab countries. 
The challenge is defensible borders. And that's really what it all comes down to today. And this is why they talk about the Jordan River Valley um, to prevent tunnels from Jordan into Judea and Samaria, if indeed that is where there is a Palestine. Um, and obviously the missile threat, thank God Israel has amazing defenses. Iron Dome performed marv marvelously in this last incursion. Um, they have the arrow system, they have David Sling. Um, I often think that, you know, as much as we worry about an Iranian nuclear threat, um, that, that would get shot down over some Arab country before it would get to Israel. Not that I want to see that happen, but we have amazing missile defense systems and we're only getting better in Israel. The technology there is second to none when it comes to missile defense. So the things we talk about is the vulnerability of Israel in the pre-67 lines. Um, I should say the 1949 armistice lines because I should use my own terminology. Nine miles from Samaria to, Net to Netanya. I've actually driven this um, with one of my guides over the years. It takes about 12 or 13 minutes. There's a, a good road that goes back and forth. And you stand in a Jewish community right over the green line and overlook Israel. What's also interesting is you have to think about the 3D, the elevations, because Israel is along the Syrian-African Rift, which is this area along the Dead Sea. Millions and millions of birds fly through there if you ever want. There's a great birding mission. Somebody was talking about trips to Israel. We have a birding mission in March uh, from Jewish National Fund. If you want to go and see migration, it's really quite amazing. Um, a little commercial there. Um, but you'll see that um, the Syrian-African Rift is here. But there are mountain ranges on both sides. And these are the lowlands where the Israeli, where the Jews live are, are much lower uh, elevations as shown by this. So if this is the, if we're talking about the sea level over here, here's Herzliya, Ariel, which is a Jewish community, is all the way up this hill. So, and then the Jordan River Valley is over here. So you can see that he who controls this area can shoot anything they want down into the valleys of Israel. And they did that from the Golan Heights. That would happen from Judea and Samaria if there were no control uh, from the Israeli military. So it really is quite a, dis a difficult situation to figure out what indeed would be a Palestinian homeland going forward. Judea and Samaria, as I said before, here's where it gets tough. This is the Oslo Accords, 1993. There's going to be a new era in the Middle East. Peace uh, is upon us. And they divide the area up into areas A, B, and C. I need to make my font larger so I can read my note here. There we go. 40% of the land uh, went to the Palestinian Authority for under civilian rule. Uh, and you can see that the Arab communities, are, the brown colors are the Arabs. The blue is uninhabited or Jewish land, which is the area, um, the area C, okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute again, but you'll see that 95% of the Arab population lived in A and B, the brown areas, and the large cities are, are the, uh, are the, are the Nablus, Tulkarim, Jericho, Bethlehem, uh, and uh, Kakilia. So um, this is the, where the Arab population is, and this is where the Jewish population is. And we're going to talk a little bit about this area in a minute here, and this area over here in a second, because those are two of the current issues. One more current, one a little less current, but uh, just so you understand. So again, 95% of the Arabs are living in A and B. C is really the Jewish families and um, and uh, really not something that should be a major dispute. The Jewish areas are divided into six regional councils, four cities, 13 local councils, 142 Israeli towns, and 360, approximately 360,000 Jews living across the Green Line. You know from Camp David, you know from 2007 that well, Camp David was going to be 97% of, of this land given to the Arabs uh, in exchange for uh, uh, um, enlarging around some of the larger communities here so that there would be no discussion about you know, Israel controlling the Jewish population uh, because the Arabs have said there'll be no Jews living in uh, a Palestinian homeland. We can have Arabs in Israel, but Jews can't live in an Arab homeland. That's just the way it is. Um, 
you can get me started there too. So um, the separation barrier. People call it the fence, the wall, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to give you some facts about this. The total length when completed, and it may be mostly done at this point, is 430 miles. The 90% the of, the, of the fence is a 200, uh, uh, is a 200 foot wide area with a fence in the middle with a paved road on either side, dirt paths on either side, I'll show you pictures in a second, um, with an, a trench so that cars can't and tanks and things can't go into Israel proper. Only 20, only 10% of the wall or fence is a 26 foot concrete wall. And that barrier where it is a wall is where there were able to be snipers firing into Israel. So that's where they put the wall up. Where there were no populations, there, it's fence. Where there were towns right on the border of, of Israel, they built some cement walls. Uh, that barrier is indeed built mostly along the green line, the 1949 armistice line. Uh, not the 1967 border. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is up north. And in, in that area, these are the trackers. These guys actually, if there's a touch on the fence, there's a computer that tells what section of fence the touch was on, and immediately the trackers are sent out. They go and they look at the dirt on either side of the fence to see where the tracks are, and they follow those tracks. If they're on the other side, they don't worry about them. If they're on Israel's side, they follow to make sure that, that uh, it's nobody nefarious going to do something uh, uh, ill-fated for Israelis. Um, so, and this is the exclusion trench to prevent cars or uh, vehicles from coming across that might uh, have bombs, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what most of it is. You know, so when people tell you the wall, most of it is a fence. Okay, and this fence stopped the bombs from blowing up in the cafes in a matter of months. By the time this was done, especially in the areas north by Kakilia, this was the most effective thing Israel's ever done to fight terrorism, I think. And this is what it looks like. So that's, and when it's a cement wall, that's what it looks like. Only 10%. Now, here is the big issue, Jerusalem, the challenge, I call it. This is what it looks like. In 1967, this was the original boundary. The old city and, and Mount Scopus was its own separate little island, but the old city was under Jordanian rule. Interestingly, I'll digress one little other time. Between 1949 and 1967, when the Jordanians held this territory, it was not annexed. It was not made part of Jordan. It was never meant to be anything relating to Jordan as part of Greater Jordan. As a matter of fact, they didn't want it because they didn't want to be responsible for the Arabs that lived there. We can get, as I said, we can get into a whole discussion about Jews fleeing Arab lands, Arabs fleeing Jewish land, et cetera, et cetera. That's a whole nother discussion. So this is what Israel, uh, Jerusalem looked like at, at, in uh, the 1967 line. This is what was annexed to become the modern city of Jerusalem that stands still today. And this was indeed annexed. This is Jerusalem. Um, both Arab and Jewish population within these city lines. Now what's interesting is if you look closely, you'll see that same, this is that finger that you saw on the other one. This black line is what I just, what I just had on the previous map. Let me actually go back because you can go back and forth. And you can see that, that um, these are all the Jewish communities, French Hill, Piscot, Zev, uh, Neve Yaakov, uh, and down to Harhoma and Gilo. You hear a lot of discussion that Gilo is, in, uh, in our, Gilo is all Jewish. It's a wonderful community. I want to say 50,000 people in Gilo. It's a big community. So this is um, the, the Jerusalem metropolitan area. This is the, what I just showed you. And if you look, the red is the, are the Arab communities, the blue are the Jewish communities, and there's the Adumin block over here, and there's the Gush block down here, which we'll talk about because those are really the issues that, we, that are current that everybody talks about. What's interesting, if you've been to Israel and you've driven through Judea and Samaria, you go up the hill, there's a Jewish community. You go down the hill, there's nothing. You go up the hill, there's nothing. You go down the hill, there's nothing. You go up the hill, there may be an Arab community. This is not a densely populated area. There are communities scattered throughout the area. What you're looking at really is probably about 
I guess by coverage could probably be 20 or 30 percent land coverage of communities. There's a lot of land here. So when the Arabs talk that we're stealing their land, there's plenty of land to be divided if people indeed wanted to have a peaceful solution to the, uh, the situation. Um, what I'll get at is, again, you're looking at the population centers. And so the big question becomes, how do you connect the Jewish communities um, to greater Jerusalem, um, to the Jewish communities in the original um, West Jerusalem. So uh, again, lots of discussions. So this is the, the, the difficult story. E1, so when you leave Jerusalem and you go over to the Adumin block, there was an area which has no population on it. And Israel, this is, um, I want to say APAC last year. This was the, or sometime last year when Joe Biden was in Israel. This was the area that was announced at the time that was the whole Fuhrer. How dare they announce, you know, building on land uh, at a time when the American vice president is in Israel. This was the block they were talking about. Uh, again, not inhabited to the goal to connect with, with specific land and communities, one part of Jerusalem to another. And that was the E1 area. It did not, by the way, this is a two mile strip here. This is a tiny area. It did not, it did not make passage from Judea and Samaria impossible. And I'll show you that right now. So if you look right here, this is the E1 area, this little area here. And from Malay Dumim to the Jordan River is another 15 kilometers or 10 miles. So there was plenty of free passage between the north and the south part of the uh, Judea and Samaria. And it was not something that cut the area in half, which was the uh, complaint that was lodged against the Israelis. Uh, and that was the first very controversial piece of land discussion. And I'll give you another one right now, the Givaot Declaration, which was just last week or two weeks ago. And this is a little piece of land down along um, the border, a little bit south of Jerusalem. And the, this is the Gush Etzion, or the Etzion block down here. By the way, Efrat Gush Etzion, this area was in the hands of the Jews in 29, and in 39 and in 48, the Jews rebuilt this community twice, I'm sorry, 29, and, and, and the late 30s. The 29 Arab riots, they killed all the Jews, or the Jews left this area. They came back, resettled it, and they lost this. This was the last piece of land to be lost the day before independence um, was declared, um, uh, the, the end, end of the uh, War of Independence. They lost this goosh block. And it wasn't until 1967 that the kids of the people that had died in that battle went back and resettled Gush Etzion. This area is one of the most vibrant, amazing, wonderful places in Israel. It's Jewish land. It always has been Jewish land. Uh, and all this little area right here is, is empty land that, hang on, I'll give you some factoids here. 1.46 square miles, 990 acres. It's nothing, guys. Nobody lives on this land, not Arabs or Israelis. It's been classed as public land since before 1948. It's part of the Yetzion block, which is part of, which will be part of Israel in any agreement. And this land is Area C, which is under Israeli control, and straddles the 1949 armistice line. So this is what the whole big stink about last week was, okay? The problem is every time Israel makes a declaration, it gives the Arab world a chance to respond. Um, this is a non-issue. A lot of these issues are non-issues. So that's what, uh, when you hear somebody talk about the vote, this is what it is. So looking forward, my goal is, my, my desire as everybody's is, is there'll be a time when it's as peaceful from space. This is a wonderful shot. If the other light were off, you can really see this is probably Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Amman, Jordan. This is obviously Cairo. This is a satellite image, as I said, with the other light off, it would be really neat. So my, my desire is that it'll be as peaceful as it is from space and that our kids won't have to fight and that they'll be able to enjoy the beaches in Tel Aviv. And um, that's my desire. And I'll take questions and I'll leave that up in the background. You can turn the lights back on. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Looking at the land space in terms of the population growth of the Palestinians, 
in comparison to the less populated group of the Israelis over the long haul. Interestingly enough, I think that statistic is actually no longer true. I think the Israelis actually are producing more children right now per couple than the Arabs are. Um, it's, it's an interesting fact. It's, it's socioeconomics. Um, they're, they're not wealthy in the West Bank, uh, although they are the, in, the, in Judea and Samaria, although they are the wealthiest uh, Arabs other than the Israeli Arabs in the Middle East, other than the ones who have all the money. But uh, as the population goes, they're a well-educated group, and when people get educated, they have less children. Uh, and it turns out that the ultra-Orthodox Israelis um, are producing more kids than the, um, than the Arab populations at this point. So the demographic in that respect um, may take 100, 100 to 200 years to even be an issue. Um, so the question becomes, it, the question becomes what's the, the long term? So there's actually, a, there's actually a school of thought now for a one state solution because the demographics aren't as scary as they used to be. Uh, personally, my attitude is I'd rather be separate from the people who want to kill me, um, but that's just my humble opinion as a somebody who follows this in studies. Did I answer? Okay. Uh, okay. Was there not a two-state solution back in 1947? And yeah, there was. And it, it failed. It did, well, it, never, it didn't fail. It never got a chance to go because the Arabs didn't recognize the existence of a Jewish state. Look, I, I absolutely know where you're going, and my attitude is it, it's, a, it's a stepwise approach that the Arabs are doing. The goal is that there should be no more Israel. They want a caliphate in the Middle East. They don't want Jews. They don't want Christians. I keep saying to my Christian friends, when are you guys going to wake up? You're next. I said, we're the canary in the coal mine. If Israel doesn't defend this area, they're coming to Europe. Much of Europe is already in trouble. And then they're coming across the oceans. Um, so, so yes, you're absolutely right. But unfortunately, we always talk about facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground is that there's a much larger, denser population of Arabs in Judea and Samaria than there are Jews. And you can have two choices. You can talk about combining all the populations into a one state of Israel solution, including Judea and Samaria. But then the demographics start to become an issue 50, 60, 70, 80 years from now, while if you separate the populations and take the three to four and a half million you know, um, Arabs and make them their own entity, you, you ensure a Jewish democracy for many years to come. The big question is, Jew Israel is not an apartheid state. There's nothing apartheid about Israel. You have Israeli um, Supreme, uh, you have Arab Supreme Court justices, you have Arabs in every way, shape, or form. You have Christian Arabs serving in the army now of Israel. Uh, you have the Druze. You have many peoples that are very well integrated into Israeli, Jewish Israeli society. So what I'll get at is that um, in order to maintain it as a democracy, you have to have a 51% vote, otherwise then it really does become apartheid. So as much as I'd love to say greater Israel, including Judea and Samaria, I'm a realist, and I think that the ultimate, so the ultimate solution is going to be some form of homeland for the Palestinians. And I, I also, uh, the term Palestinian is very interesting, because before 1948, the entire area was called Palestine. The Palestine Orchestra was the Jewish orchestra in Jerusalem. The Palestine Press or Post, the Palestine Post was today's Jerusalem Post. Palestine was not an Arab term. It was the name of the land that was before it became the modern state of Israel. It's a Greek term. Uh, there, I've, I've actually heard a couple of different um, uh, discussions about where, did it come from the Philistines? Did it come from, I'm not sure. I've heard three or four different things. Uh, but we'll go that direction. Go. Could we just go back? Could we just go back yeah. and, uh, on, on the screen? And yeah. 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 Yeah.
Now, it looks to me like this. We take the Jordan River. It's pretty much a straight line. Come on. And now, now I'm really challenged. So now it's not working at all. Hold on. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm going to find it for you. Uh, let me find a good one. Here we go. There we go. Okay, there, okay, there you are. Right. Now it looks like it's a straight line when, when you start at Syria and you go all the way down to... Okay. Correct. Okay. That's the Syrian African Rift. But, but you're showing uh, on the right side of it as being Jordan. Yes. So which is the territory that would become then the... This. Uh, Arab what they have it called the West Bank here. Yeah. Here's Gaza, okay. here's the West Bank. But, but is, is there any other territory to the right of this? This yeah. is all Jordan. Oh, this is all Jordan. And this is all Jordan, then, it, then it's a, Iraq and Iran and all our other friends. So, so what is it that the, that, is it that the uh, Arabs they, the they want well, actually what they want is they want all of this, but but they're willing to do it a little at a time by taking this and this. Interestingly enough, the same discussion here. Uh, Egypt controlled Gaza, one and a half million Arabs from forty uh, from forty nine to 67 and also didn't absorb that. Interestingly enough, UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, has given billions of dollars to these populations in Gaza and Judea and Samaria. This is the only population in the world that after the first generation of refugees are still refugees. Every other generation of refugees has been settled by countries outside uh, of, of the areas or by whoever took over those areas. Only these people and their offspring it's there, uh, there's four and a half million Palestinians today. There are really only about 60,000 left of the originals uh, that, that, fled the, uh, that fled Israel proper during the... If you, if you know about the War of Independence, when the war was fought, the Arab countries attacking Israel said, you leave your towns, we'll destroy the Jewish people, we'll push them into the sea, and you'll go back and you'll have all of, of uh, Palestine. Didn't happen that way. So about 700, the, the, the number that the UN uses is about 750,000 people either fled or were displaced during the War of Independence. Interestingly enough, what's not talked about is that right after the War of Independence, from 1949 to 1951, all the Arab countries expelled all the Jews in their countries. 750,000 plus Jews left the Arab countries. Israel doubled its population in three, two to three years, from 600,000 to 1.2 million. Imagine America going from 300 million to 600 million people in two years. No infrastructure to do it, no resources, no anything. But they were Jews that were refugees and they needed to be resettled. Israel resettled 600,000 of them into Israel proper, okay? The Arabs never absorbed one Palestinian refugee. So this problem that exists all these years later is contrived. It should never have existed, but it does. They were left in refugee camps to be a pawn for a future argument that's going on still today. OK? So essentially, the border of contention right now is, is this. that area from the from, when, from the, the UN decided to the borders for Israel. Actually, this isn't even what it looks like. Um, Charles, this is, this is what it looked like after 67, after Egypt, we gave, if they gave back land to Egypt. <coughs> the Golan Heights was not part of the original partition plan. Much of the area in the north and over here was part of what would have been the, the Arab homeland because it was based on populations. So this was after the... 48 war, the war of independence is all of this, and these are the areas in question where the Palestinian refugees reside. So the goal is if you can get this part now, you can potentially get the rest later. Next question. One or two more questions. Yeah. I think it's fundamentally important to mention that something you said is completely wrong. You end did not give Israel any land whatsoever. Right. Nothing. You went, it was done, the legal basis for, for the establishment of the Jewish state when former 
non-Arab Ottoman Empire land right. was not the United Nations, wasn't even the League of Nations. It was a treaty that was based on a treaty for signing that was based on the San Remo Conference yeah. when they carved up the Ottoman Empire. Right. There was two or three other times where international committees or bodies recommended changes, alterations to that legal allocation of land on the Patel Commission, Peel right. Board Appeal, in 1937. Israel was going to be a fraction of what it is now, a tiny little bit. And, and the Zionists originally said yes, but the Arabs said no. Right. Why did they say no? Because they said it, that it lied on Arab land, some said Islamic land. Right. Remember, that was all part of the caliphate that was being run by the, the Turks. It's part of the and Turkish no Empire. Ever was that area ruled by indigenous Arabs. The only time Arabs ever had control of that land was part of foreign empires. Right. It was ruled from afar. The last time that was a, a ruled by an indigenous state was biblical Israel. Yep. Then there was no time to go here. Just because you keep hearing over and over and over that it's Arab land and Palestinian land, everybody yeah. here can say one of the last five. It's still not true, is it? Yeah. There is absolutely no basis that any neutral party can find right. saying that there's any entity on this planet that has the right to their, declare sovereignty on all that area other than the right. And I, I think that was my original premise, and that was the whole goal, was to show you through maps, biblical maps and modern maps, that this land has been Jewish land, and is Jewish land both legally, biblically, and historically. And that's why I started out by saying, if Israel chooses to give land for peace, they're giving their land. It's not, they're not giving back anything. They're well, giving I their land. Sure. The green line. Yeah. Do you hear the green line? That was the point that the Israelis stopped the foreign Arab armies. They stopped them, and then where they were located for 19 years, Judea, Samaria, and, right. and Gaza, that was Arab occupied Israel. It sounds almost crazy off the wall right wing, but you cannot dispute it. Right. That land was allocated legally for Israel. Foreign right. Arab armies have been occupied. After 19 years, those foreign Arab armies were expelled. Right. In 1967. Yep. Anywhere else in the world, you'd say it's liberated. Right? Not in Israel. Not in Israel. It's a double standard. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Thank you. I'd like to give you this uh, certificate of thank appreciation you. as a speaker to us. We really appreciate you coming. It's My pleasure. Your time and your wife, thank you so thank much. You. you have one more duty, though, that we ask you to do. Oh, I'm yeah, glad I didn't buy one because then if I had one, that would so be a problem. If you pull it, then uh, I'll take the number from you because I have a couple of announcements. Uh, we'll make. Do the certificate one more time. Oh, uh, yeah. we're too quick. Why don't we get out here, sir? Yeah. Go out of the light. Go out of the light. Go into the light. There you go. Get my thin side. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And before I read the number for 5050, I'm not going to be an investing club. Mark's not here. Okay, so normally we do have an investment club. Uh, reminder if you need a shirt, see Dick, let us know. We'll be ordering more. I sent out to Randy, and Randy, I, hopefully you'll be able to get it out. The next uh, 15 months worth of meetings we have booked here. Is that supposed to go out every month? Well, I just sent it to you last night, so. I got it. Oh, oh you got it right. So the board did so. You, you can put that on your calendar so you don't forget when our next meetings are. Again, welcome to our new members. And yes, we appreciate you coming. And the 50-50. Winner is 076250. Uh, no. No, not again. Six, ah. 07 6250. Yeah. Travesty.
And it's for how much, uh, Ed? Four dollars. Four dollars? Four dollars. Four dollars. Everybody, thank you for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you again. And a healthy and happy new year. Randy.